Well, first of all, Sophie, congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award. So how does it feel? Um, it's another Lifetime Achievement Award. It celebrates overnight success, which takes at least 30 years, as far as I can tell. And I mean, um, your career is so inspirational, especially for women in science and tech. Um, what would your um, biggest tips be for maybe those who are starting out, maybe a bit um, not as confident in terms of what, how their career is going to progress? What have been maybe the biggest tips that you could give people? Well, most of the stuff that you make is hard. Um, and you can think of this in a simple way. If you go to the National Gallery and you look at one of the pictures there and you think, my God, how did somebody make something like that? And the answer is it just takes an enormous amount of time and, and some background training. But you know, it's a lot of time. A portrait takes years sometimes to create. Months if they're very, very good and it's a small portrait. The big canvases that are really impressive, the artist probably struggled for years. And that's how it is for designing things in technology. It takes years. It's a multi-year effort, usually of a highly skilled team that works well together. I've been very lucky to work through my career with a lot of highly skilled teams where we've had a very good working relationship and knew everything. So that's what you look for. There's, there, you know, I made the joke about overnight success takes 30 years. But to build anything new and complicated, it's not the sort of quick thing. It's a sustained effort over a long period of time. And that's what matters. You also need to get many people's different input to make something that's unique and novel. And I think this is where particularly women in tech have a lot to offer and why the tech industry generally is so desperate to get more women in. Because if you have a bunch of companies that are designed and along the same sort of template and they've got a whole bunch of computer science engineering graduates staffing them, they tend to design the same sorts of things and approach um, problem solving in the same sorts of ways. If they've got disparate teams, women, men, different backgrounds, different engineering backgrounds, different ways of thinking, then you solve problems differently, build different things and become a more successful company. There's a fascinating statistic. Very few women get to the top of companies at the moment. And that's a big shame. But when you look at the companies that women are on top of, they're overwhelmingly more successful ones. If you take the percentage of companies that women run, they're the more successful companies. So that's promising, at least. Diversity counts for a lot in this industry. Definitely. And I mean... There's been a lot of focus over, especially the last two or three years, where um, governments and private companies are looking to target um, more w um, girls in schools to get them into um, tech at an earlier age. Do you think um, things like coding should be maybe taught at a teenage level, or do you think it's something that someone has to grow into um, at a more mature age? I'm not sure it matters. So obviously I grew up before there were pervasive computers, before there were computers in schools. I wasn't taught coding particularly early. I got a vacation job between school and university where I worked for a research plant and they had a PDP-8 and a PDP-11 and I wrote a noughts and crosses game on the PDP-11 as one of the first programs I ever wrote. Um, there's no need to do these things as early as they seem to be claiming in much the same way that, that they don't expect people at school to write full-blown novels or something like that. Um, you don't need to, to do this early on, but having an appreciation of tech and what it can do and remembering that the phone in your handbag is a programmable device. Many people have lost sight of the fact that you can develop programs for these things on them. And they think that all the magical apps come from people with you know, big development teams um, all working away. But it doesn't have to be like that. You can get development systems that run on your phone or your iPad or your tablet and write your own stuff on those things directly. You don't have to have anything else. Your phone remains a programmable device. If you have iOS, there's a wonderful development environment called Codea, C-O-D-E-A. And you download that app and you can uh, gain control of your Apple device and write everything that you thought was possible. 
provided you can think of it. So it's coming up with the idea. Well, the great thing about the digital evolution, I suppose, is that it's constantly changing and there's new trends almost like every six months. From your point of view, where do you see the future over the um, in terms of maybe not just new apps, but new types of maybe technology to do with tablets and iPhones or general smartphones? Where do you see that going? Well, generation to generation, things don't actually change very much. It's multi-generational where... Over several design cycles, things have changed in a bigger way, and it may be decades before things change a huge amount. So we can trace our iPhones back to iPods, and that's quite a long generational set of steps. So you don't look forward to what's going to happen in 2015, because that will be an incremental change on what you know. And similarly, if you try to project forward from what's going to happen between 2014 and 2015 to 2025 then something will catch you completely blindsided. Um, my crystal ball sort of fuzzes out at about five years' horizon where you can, you can sort of see where things are generally going, but you're not quite sure. And that's where the fuzz sets in. So I wait and see. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>